Hi, this is uh, Mazin Kerala, uh, Associate Professor at uh, University of North Dakota. Um, we'll uh, uh, present uh, today's uh, webinar of ICU REACH uh, about the application of uh, esophageal pressure measurement uh, in patients with uh, respiratory failure. The outline of the talk will be starting uh, with some uh, physiological background and then we'll describe the technique before we move to some clinical applications and we'll end with some case studies. Uh, but first we'll uh, talk about uh, some physiological uh, background uh, and uh, we uh, understand that uh, when we give the breath on the ventilator we give a positive pressure that positive pressure is the airway pressure and when we pause the respiratory system uh, we get the plateau pressure that plateau pressure approximates the alveolar pressure the plateau pressure is uh, the static airway pressure at zero flow it will ap approximate the alveolar pressure. So transpulmonary pressure, what we use in the formula here is the what we can measure on the ventilator, which is the airway pressure. So the airway pressure at zero flow, which is the plateau pressure, minus the pleural pressure will give you the transpulmonary pressure. And that's what we'll be talking about in this session. Now, it's important to understand also in the equation of motion, when everything is actually moving, and the patient uh, <clears throat> is uh, breathing, uh, at that time the total pressure uh, required to deliver the breath is the uh, sum of the airway pressure and the pressure generated by the patient. This uh, pressure, uh, these pressures are uh, needed to overcome number one, uh, uh, any auto beep uh, that is in the system, uh, plus the uh, respiratory system elastins uh, multiplied by the volume, plus the respiratory system resistance multiplied by the flow. If the patient is not breathing, we can eliminate this uh, pressure completely. If the patient has zero uh, uh, auto beep, we can get rid of uh, the pressure needed to overcome the auto beep. And if we put the system at static uh, phase, meaning that uh, in, uh, at plateau, we can get rid of the resistor, uh, respiratory system resistance and the flow. So we are left with uh, uh, the respiratory system elastins multiplied by the volume and this is uh, the pressure needed to overcome this. And we have two components in this. The first component is chest wall component and the second component is lung component. And without measuring the uh, esophageal pressure, we won't be able to differentiate between the uh, uh, pressure needed to overcome the chest wall uh, elastins uh, and the pressure needed to overcome the lung elastins. There are multiple factors that uh, affect esophageal pressure. Uh, uh, these factors include respiratory mechanics, uh, the lung volume delivered, the weight of the mediastinum, the abdomen and the pressure inside the abdomen, the patient's uh, posture and the weight of the patient, uh, reactivity of the esophageal muscle, uh, smooth muscle wall, and the mechanical properties of the uh, balloon. You need to understand that uh, uh, this difference between the airway pressure and the esophageal pressure is the transpulmonary pressure, and this is different in uh, uh, volume control ventilation uh, uh, versus uh, pressure uh, control ventilation between passive and uh, active press. So in volume control ventilation, in passive breath, where the patient is not breathing, assuming that the esophageal pressure is zero, the transpulmonary pressure is the difference between the airway pressure and the esophageal pressure. If the patient starts to breathe, that uh, esophageal pressure is dropped. Along with this drop, the airway pressure will drop in the same magnitude, keeping the transpulmonary pressure the same. And the tidal volume will be the same in both cases. However, in pressure controlled mode of ventilation, when the patient starts to breathe, he pulls down the esophageal pressure negatively, and then the transpulmonary pressure will be larger because the airway pressure is the same, and this results in higher uh, volume delivered to the patient compared to the passive breath. This will show you the same thing also. Uh, difference between uh, airway pressure and the uh, esophageal pressure is the transpulmonary pressure, 
this is in passive breath compared to an active breath which is uh, uh, keeping the trans which uh, keeps the transpulmonary pressure the same resulting in the same tidal volume compared to pressures control mode of ventilation the difference between the uh, airway pressure and the esophageal pressure will be larger resulting into larger tidal volume with this background I describe the technique of insertion of uh, the esophageal uh, pressure uh, monitor and uh, I'm going to use the uh, video from uh, Hamilton Medical Company and uh, this uh, technique will be the same in all types of uh, uh, catheters but the filling volumes of the esophageal balloons can differ from one type to another so you need to uh, look at the instructions uh, of use for each uh, catheter that you are using uh, according to its manufacturer and the first step is uh, unpack the catheter uh, remove the uh, uh, pressure lines and the catheter and uh, get it ready connect uh, these two catheters together and then inflate uh, the balloon uh, to test for any leak and usually in this uh, type of catheter we put 8 uh, cc's in and pull out uh, uh, 4 uh, cc's so get out 4 and then lock it so after testing the balloon if everything is fine you connect the ventilator connection line into the pressure port of the ventilator so this is the pressure port of the ventilator connected to the pressure line <coughs> and to estimate the length of the tube that needs to be inserted measure the distance from the lower part of the sternum across the ear to the tip of the nose so you go from the lower part of the sternum where the balloon is and then to the ear and back to in front to uh, the nose and then this is marked at uh, around 475 insert the guide wire into the internal line And then uh, uh, to make it easier, you uh, uh, apply either gel or uh, silicone spray to the catheter. And you insert it uh, in a similar way as uh, uh, any nasocastric tube. You put the patient in recumbent uh, position. And uh, if you uh, face any resistance, uh, you can uh, just turn the catheter uh, to the left or to the right. To the right. And then advance it uh, all the way uh, passing the uh, uh, mark that you made for the length of the catheter so you go if it was 475 you go to 500 for example so you can get to the stomach and test the catheter first in the stomach so now we are uh, at uh, 500 uh, mark uh, check the ventilator display to make sure that the esophageal pressure curve is at zero to avoid any technical uh, misreadings and here where you see the uh, pressure uh, is at zero and then connect the three-way stopcock of the nasocastric catheter to the ventilator connection line Open the three uh, waist uh, stopcock, inflate the balloon with 8 ml, and then remove 4, and then close. So, here, okay, make sure the balloon deflated first, and then you put in uh, 8 cc's, and then get out 4, and then open it uh, to the pressure uh, line. Check the pressure curve uh, on the ventilator, it should increase during inspiration, and this is inspiration it increases with each inspiration so 
to assure the catheter tip is well within the stomach, apply a gentle compression on, uh, of the abdomen and observe the waveform on the pressure uh, uh, waveform tracing. You can see here, let me stop it for you. So you can see how when we apply a gentle pressure on the abdomen, the uh, esophageal pressure goes up on the uh, esophageal pressure tracing. Retrieve the uh, gently until uh, cardiac oscillations uh, appear on the uh, esophageal uh, pressure waveform. So that assures that you are in the lower part of the esophagus. So we retrieved a little bit and then we look at the oscillations that indicates uh, uh, the uh, location posteriorly to the heart. And then We perform an inclusion by compressing the patient's chest during an expiratory hold maneuver. The esophageal pressure and the airway pressure waveforms uh, should display similar changes if the catheter is positioned correctly. So, and this is a, in a patient who is paralyzed. So what you see here on the, uh, you put an expiratory hold first for a few seconds, you push on the chest, and you should see that there's an increase in the airway pressure similar to the increase in the esophageal pressure. So you can see here that this increases are the same, and that uh, confirms that the catheter is in the right place, and then you uh, just affix it to the tip of the nose uh, and you uh, remove the guide wire out of the uh, tube and you cover the caps uh, at the end. So it's very simple, uh, relatively simple procedure. It has to be done, takes like uh, five to seven minutes altogether if there is no complications. And then you can do a chest x-ray to confirm the right placement of the uh, nasogastric tube uh, just uh, behind the heart. And you can notice here that there's another tube uh, inside the st uh, stomach that serves for other purposes. Some of the catheters are equipped in providing a uh, nasogastric tube at the same time uh, along with the uh, esophageal uh, balloon monitor. Now, in a patient who's uh, spontaneously breathing, uh, you uh, uh, do uh, an occlusion test, uh, expiratory exclusion test. If the patient is spontaneously breathing, the uh, esophageal pressure will drop uh, at the same magnitude uh, as the drop in the uh, airway pressure. Uh, what we did on uh, the previous example, in a patient who's paralyzed, we put a uh, compression external compression on the chest and what we notice after including uh, the uh, expiratory uh, port with expiratory bows uh, we will see that uh, the rise in the esophageal pressure is similar to the rise in the airway pressure. This confirms that uh, the catheter is working well and we can interpret uh, the measurements uh, uh, by the catheter. So this is putting it together, uh, this is the airway pressure, this is the flow esophageal pressure here and transpulmonary pressure. We read transpulmonary pressure uh, at the end of uh, uh, expiration when the flow is zero. So at this point, the flow is uh, zero and uh, corresponding to this point, the pressure is 14, which is the PEEP level. And the esophageal pressure here is 17. So the transpulmonary pressure will be 14 minus 17 is minus three. And then you see here how we uh, perform the uh, uh, push test. Uh, we pushed on the uh, chest and the increase in the uh, airway pressure is similar to the increase in the esophageal pressure. With this, uh, we can go into the clinical applications uh, of uh, the esophageal pressure uh, measurement. And uh, we will be talking about four different uh, clinical applications. The first one is uh, uh, 
application of uh, uh, esophageal pressure monitoring in ARDS patients, how to determine a better beep, differentiate between the chest wall and the lung compliance, and estimate the, estimates the true driving pressure. And then we'll throw the concept of transmural vascular pressure for better assessment of volume status. Uh, and then we'll move to how we use this uh, uh, modality to improve patient uh, ventilator synchrony, use less uh, sedation, uh, better tolerance, and more comfort for the patient. And then we'll talk about the uh, esophageal pressure time product uh, that can be used for the assessment of work of breathing and uh, can assist in uh, weaning of the, the patient of the ventilator. So in mechanical uh, ventilation of patients with ARDS, uh, let me start with uh, these three different uh, patients uh, where I'm using the same airway pressure. I'm putting here the alveolar pressure of 30, which is the uh, plateau pressure. The plateau pressure is uh, put here at uh, uh, 30 centimeter of water uh, in a patient uh, who has no inspiratory effort. So the transpulmonary pressure, assuming that the pleural pressure is zero in this patient, the uh, transpulmonary pressure will be 30. Now, notice that with the same alveolar pressure that we have of 30 centimeter of water, in a patient who's spontaneously breathing, he has active inspiratory efforts, he can generate up to minus 15, for example, of pleural pressure, and that will give you a transpulmonary pressure of 30 minus minus 15, that will equal total of 45 that will result into larger tidal volume in pressure control mode of ventilation. Compare this with the third case here, where we have an increased abdominal pressure for whatever reason. And that abdominal pressure is transmitted into the chest, so the pleural pressure is increased too. So let's assume that we have a pleural pressure of 15. That same pressure that is used in the previous two cases will result into transpulmonary pressure of only 15, which is 30 minus 15 will equal 15, and they will result, this will result into lower tidal volume uh, generated by this pressure compared to the first case. And this is actually an end, uh, end of inspiration. So let's take a look on it when uh, we compare end of inspiration with end of expiration. So we always have to measure what we call inspiratory transpulmonary pressure and expiratory transpulmonary pressure. And let's take these two cases here. The first one is a paralyzed patient who is thin, is not obese. And we use the same pressure here in inspiration 30 and assume that the pleural pressure is zero. That would give us inspiratory transpulmonary pressure of 30. Now in expiration, let's assume that we have, uh, we put a beep of five. So the alveolar pressure here is 5 cm of water minus the pleural pressure of 0 that will give you expiratory pleural pressure of 5. Now compare this with an obese patient who is paralyzed too, is not breathing. So the same pressure in the, same, in the first one of 30 uh, will give you inspiratory transpulmonary pressure of 15 as we just talked before. 30 minus 15 equals 15. Now what happens in expiration, the beep is at level of 5, but we still have the pleural pressure of uh, 15, so the expiratory transpulmonary pressure will be 5 minus 15 will equal minus 10. That means that the pleura, the pleural pressure will exert pressure on the alveoli and will result into collapse of the alveoli. And that's what you want to prevent in those patients who are on the ventilator. So what will give you an increased uh, pleural pressure or increased elastance of the chest wall? Any increase in uh, intra-abdominal uh, pressure or intra-abdominal hypertension or intra-abdominal compartment syndrome, massive ascites, uh, any accumulation of fluid inside the uh, 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 thorax, pleural effusion or uh, hemothorax, uh, uh, thoracic trauma, or edema of the intrathoracic and uh, intra-abdominal tissues as uh, a result of uh, fluid resuscitation in uh, hemodynamically unstable patient. 
Now, without measuring the pleural pressure, adjusting the ventilator settings only on the basis of airway pressure may not be satisfactory for the protective lung strategy when ventilating subjects with ARDS. So for that reason, <coughs> Talmor and uh, his colleagues uh, looked at uh, uh, using this modality in uh, acute lung injury and published uh, their work at uh, the New England Journal of Medicine. This is back in 2018 in Boston. And what they used is two different groups. The first group was ventilated according to ARDS uh, uh, network strategies uh, for protective lung uh, strategy. And they used the FIO2 PEEP table to determine the level of PEEP based on the FIO2 level. And this is a control group. In the esophageal pressure guided group, what they use instead of the PEEP is the expiratory transpulmonary pressure. So they adjusted the PEEP to give you the expiratory transpulmonary pressure of 0 to 10 based on what is the value of the FIO2. So for example, if it was 0 0.7, that expiratory transpulmonary pressure will be around 4. If the FIO2 is uh, 0.9 or 90 percent, that pressure will be, the transpulmonary pressure will be set at 8. So the B will be adjusted to give you that uh, value of the transpulmonary pressure. And here what they found. This is the parameters that they monitored. They had a total of 30 patients, <coughs> excuse me, in the esophageal pressure uh, group compared with 31 at, at baseline in the conventional treatment. They looked at the PF ratio, PO2 divided by FIO2, and you can see in, uh, it was very similar in both groups with uh, no statistical significance. The respiratory system compliance, very similar, 36 uh, plus minus 12 and 36 plus minus 10, no statistical significance. And they also looked at the physiological dead space because applying beep will uh, expand the alveoli, may increase the physiological dead space. At the baseline, there was no difference in the physiological dead space. After 72 hours, uh, we had only 29 uh, patients in each of these groups, but look at the difference in uh, terms of the BF, BF ratio. The BF ratio increased from 147 to 280 in the esophageal pressure guided group, in conventional treatment increased from 145 to 191. <clears throat> there was statistical significance between these two uh, values here, 280 versus 191, with a p-value of 0 0.002. At the same time, there was statistical significance in the improvement of the respiratory system compliance between 45 and 35. In the conventional uh, treatment group, it did not differ much, from the uh, baseline. However, in the esophageal pressure guided uh, group, it went up from 36 all the way to 45 uh, in terms of the compliance. The statistical significance is uh, manifested here with a p-value of 0 0.005. And notice that despite uh, the higher uh, uh, p in this group, uh, the physiological dead space did not uh, change. The difference between the two groups was not statistically significant. At the same time, they looked at the mortality, but the study was not powered to, uh, uh, to uh, look at uh, uh, whether this is uh, 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 powerful enough to uh, determine the uh, differences, and, uh, but it showed uh, some uh, trend towards improved mortality with 28-day uh, mortality of 17% in the esophageal pressure guided group versus 39% in the conventional treatment group and you can see the p-value is 0 0.05. So there was a trend towards improving mortality between the two groups. Now this uh, is only to show you the difference in the uh, total beep applied and you can see here that the, the beep was much higher compared to the conventional uh, treatment group with uh, statistical uh, significance. Now this uh, graph will show you the same thing, uh, an improvement in the BF ratio, improvement in the esophageal uh, uh, 
uh, in uh, the uh, respiratory system compliance uh, the uh, no improve no no changes in the ratio of uh, dead space uh, the peep level was higher in the esophageal pressure the transpulmonary and expiratory pressure was higher in the esophageal pressure group the plateau pressure was higher also in the same in the esophageal group and the transpulmonary and inspiratory pressure was almost the same between the two groups. The conclusion from this study is that the transpulmonary uh, pressure uh, approach uh, significantly improved oxygenation and compliance and showed a trend toward reduced mortality. The second application is transmural vascular pressure and this is a theory as I don't have any uh, studies uh, looking at this uh, uh, subject here but uh, let me uh, explain to you so you can understand what I mean by that the transmural pressure is the pressure be uh, difference between inside the vessel and the pressure outside the vessel and when I put uh, a central line in the superior vena cava this central line will measure the pressure here let's assume that we have two patients here and the reading in these two patients is 20 centimeter water of CVV. Theoretically, you would give diuretics for those patients. If you did not know about what is the transmural uh, uh, pressure or the esophageal pressure. Now the uh, esophageal pressure, which is uh, a surrogate of the intrathoracic pressure, is uh, measured with the esophageal pressure here. Let's assume that we have a pressure of zero at that time your transmural vascular pressure here will be the difference between this pressure and this pressure and that means the transmural pressure here is 20 in this case if you know that this is 20 you are right you can give the patient Lasix however in the other case here if the esophageal pressure is 18 the transmural pressure this pressure will apply pressure on the vessel here so that reading is not an accurate reading of the pressure because the transmural pressure is 20 minus 18 equals 2 in this case your patient is dehydrated or volume depleted and he needs fluids so you can see how if you rely on the CVB measurement alone without looking at the transmural vascular pressure you will be wrong in 50% of the time the third application of the esophageal pressure monitoring is to improve patient ventilator synchrony. I'm going to show you this example here where if you're looking only at the uh, airway pressure tracing without knowing what the patient is doing, you would notice here that there is an increase in the pressure at the end of inspiratory time here. You notice here that the patient started with a negative deflection. Now if you correlate this with the patient's effort, uh, you will see that the inspiration starts here and continues to be negative pressure in, in the esophagus. At this point here, the patient starts to exhale. However, if you get a column all the way up, you will see that the patient on the ventilator is still in inspiration. So the patient is exhaling and this positive pressure is reflected on the airway pressure as a spike at the end of inspiration. So this is represented similarly here this is what we call delayed cycling you can see the negative pressure is uh, started to go back to the baseline the expiration starts here but the inspiration on the ventilator did not end yet so this is delayed cycling now take a look here on this example where you see without looking at the esophageal pressure you will not understand exactly what's going on here so notice that you have double press here, so this is double triggering. And notice that the patient decreases his, negative, his, his esophageal pressure first. He gets the first breath here. Now without a full exhalation, his pressure continues to go down and he triggers another breath. And he uh, would have double triggering with breath stacking. Now compared to this one, if you do not have esophageal pressure monitoring, this would be similar to the previous one here. But look at the esophageal pressure monitoring, you will see that the first breath is generated with a positive esophageal pressure. 
the patient is not breathing. What generated the second breath is what we call reverse triggering. This breath here, the positive pressure on the diaphragm, stimulated the diaphragm and caused it to uh, contract again and cause the second uh, breath. So this is also uh, breath stacking, but it is a different mechanism than the double triggering here. It is reverse triggering. Take a look here. You will see that the patient continues to breathe with a negative pressure, but the ventilator uh, uh, inspiratory time is finished, and this is premature cycling. You en we ended the inspiratory uh, breath much earlier than the patient uh, uh, inspiration. And here the patient is uh, taking a negative deflections without uh, the ability to trigger the ventilator. Uh, and uh, this is what we uh, call ineffective efforts of the patient. So <clears throat> the last thing that we can use this catheter for is the uh, determination of the uh, esophageal uh, pressure time product that will help us in assessing the work of breathing and uh, weaning the patient of the ventilator. So to understand this, I want to uh, link the uh, flow with the esophageal pressure. So the start of the flow here, at this point, let's take a column and see what we see here is that the, the pressure is already negative. And the start of the negative pressure happened earlier than this. This is the onset of inspiratory flow. However, the onset of patient uh, inspiration happened earlier here. And there was a drop in the pressure from the zero all the way down to minus uh, nine. This uh, pressure is the pressure required to overcome the dynamic uh, beep or the intrinsic beep. This pressure will continue throughout the inspiratory uh, effort of the patient. So uh, it will continue to overcome it throughout inspiration. And then the pressure drop is required to overcome the airway resistance represented by this dotted uh, uh, pink area. And also the lung compliance uh, represented by the uh, blue uh, <coughs> area. And uh, at the same time, when the patient takes a breath, there's a chest wall recall that he needs to overcome. That's why you see this rise here. And this area all together represents the, uh, uh, the uh, esophageal uh, product, uh, pressure time product. So <coughs> the pressure changes over time all together or area under the curve, all the colors together will rep uh, represent the uh, pressure time product uh, of the esophagus. Uh, this is very important uh, because it gives you an information about how much oxygen the patient needs to uh, consume by these respiratory muscles in patients with hemodynamic instability. So you need to relax the inspiratory muscles if you see that this product is high. The other thing that you can use this uh, uh, for is titrating ventilatory support to achieve near normal levels of inspiratory effort that may prevent diaphragmatic uh, injury and accelerate liberation from the ventilator. It can also be used in, uh, uh, in detecting injurious patterns of uh, uh, ventilation in patients with ARDAs but the most important use for this is with weaning trials. And this is demonstrated by the work of uh, uh, Dr. Taben and his colleagues, published uh, in 2005, where they looked at uh, the swings in esophageal pressure during the uh, weaning trials. And just to demonstrate what they looked at, this is a success trial and this is a failed trial. You can see how in failed trials, they were able to see fluctuation or swings in that uh, pressure pro uh, time product uh, over time, uh, over the time of the weaning trial. Compared to a success uh, uh, a trial, there is no much swings in this pressure. It was like stable throughout the uh, duration of the trial. Notice that in uh, the failed trial here, the uh, rapid shallow breathing index remained below 105, where you would uh, consider this as a good candidate for extubation if he did not have the uh, esophageal uh, pressure time product. And when they put uh, their uh, work together and looked at the sensitivity and specificity, they found that the esophageal pressure uh, time product uh, trend index is very highly sensitive at 90, 91% and uh, specific at 89% 
compared to the rapid shallow breathing index at 82% versus 67%. The likelihood that uh, uh, the patient will uh, succeed weaning if you use this uh, modality is 8.2 uh, higher times than uh, uh, if you if you use the only the esophageal uh, uh, swing during the first minute. So you need to do it over the uh, uh, duration of the weaning trial. It is four times more than uh, if you rely only on the uh, uh, rapid shallow breathing index. They concluded that continuous monitoring of esophageal pressure swings during a spontaneous breathing trial provides additional guidance in patient management over test used for de deciding when to initiate weaning and when to extubate your patient. So with this, the uh, uh, European Society of Intensive Care uh, Medicine put some guidelines that uh, will guide us actually in uh, determination of what are those pressure values that we need to measure uh, when we uh, uh, use this modality uh, uh, guiding the ventilatory support. So the first one is we need to target transpulmonary and inspiratory pressure less than 20 centimeter of water. This is mainly to, over, uh, to avoid over distension. The second uh, uh, thing is we need to uh, keep the transpulmonary and expiratory pressure between 0 and 5, you can go up to 10 as we mentioned in the study. This is mainly to avoid lung collapse. And then we can calculate the what we call the true driving pressure or the transpulmonary driving pressure. It's simply the transpulmonary and inspiratory pressure minus the transpulmonary and expiratory pressure and you can keep this value between 10 and 15 uh, to, uh, for optimal uh, ventilatory support for your patient. So let's use this in our examples here. I'm going to present a few case studies. The first one is a, a patient who is uh, 78 year old who uh, is admitted with worsening respiratory distress and hypoxemia. And he's on FIO2 of 60%. A PO2 of 63%, uh, 63 millimeter mercury. When we did a chest X ray for this patient, you can see that the patient has bipedal infiltrates, but I don't see the bilateral pulmonary infiltrates that are actually uh, consistent with ARDS pattern. For that reason, we decided to do uh, a CT scan to rule out pulmonary embolism, and uh, there was no pulmonary embolism, but we noticed bipedal infiltrates and some infiltrates that is actually caused by atelectasis and some pleural effusion minimally in both uh, bases. So we decided to uh, ventilate this patient with protective lung strategy, uh, keeping the tidal volume at 460, which is uh, 6 ml per kg of ideal body weight. We, uh, based on the FIO2 uh, of 60%, we determined to, keep, to, to give him a PEEP of 12. With this, we got a plateau pressure or peak pressure here of 30 centimeter of water. So within the protective lung strategy, we were doing fine, but the driving pressure was 30 minus 12, which was 18, and we thought this is a high driving pressure that we need to decrease. So we placed a, a, an esophageal catheter, and we measured the esophageal pressure and the transpulmonary uh, pressure. So this is the esophageal uh, uh, catheter. You can see here inspiration, and this is expiration. So the uh, beep level was still at 12 before we made any uh, changes. The esophageal pressure was me measured at 15, and then not notice that the transpulmonary uh, and expiratory pressure is minus 3, meaning that there is uh, pressure on uh, on the alveoli causing al uh, the alveolar collapse. So what we decided to do is <clears throat> we need to target end expiratory transpulmonary pressure at 0 to 5. In order to do that, we increase the beep from 12 to 18. And with beep of 18, the uh, uh, beak pressure remained at 30 
and the transpulmonary pressure right now is plus one so we achieved the goal and that is giving us driving pressure of 30 minus 18 equals to 12. in order to confirm this we want we we had to do the expiratory and inspiratory hold in order to get the trans expiratory transpulmonary pressure we need to put a hold in the system in expiration for a few seconds three to five seconds would be enough and that's what we did here and we <clears throat> put the hold in expiration and uh, we measure the pressure at zero flow so this is the zero flow here so that end expiratory pressure is 18.5 the esophageal pressure is 16.9 and the transpulmonary pressure is exactly at 1.6 at the same time we wanted to put an inspiratory hold for a few seconds and measure the transpulmonary pressure in inspiration and this is the inspiration you can see the peak pressure and this is a hold zero flow the peak pressure went down slightly eliminated the airway pressure that is required to overcome the resistance and the flow and the plateau pressure is measured at 27.6 the esophageal pressure is inspiration is measured as at 20.7 and that gives you a transpulmonary pressure in inspiration of 6.9 so driving pressure is this pressure minus the previous pressure is very minimal driving pressure true driving pressure pressure on the ventilator so this way we confirm that actually getting the air inside the lung is not because of uh, high elastans it is because uh, it is not because of high elastans of the lungs but it is because of high elastans of the chest wall and the abdomen and in fact uh, this patient later went into ARDAs and he had a different mechanism so the second case is uh, a patient who, who is 62 year old with multiple comorbidities who presented with bilateral pneumonia he had worsening hypoxemia with a po2 of 63 and he was put on 70 percent fio2 initially he was placed on a peep of 12 tidal volume of 460 and he had a peak pressure of 30 three so we decided to put an esophageal uh, catheter to titrate his peep and this is ARDS now so this beep here at 12 we did not change it yet and tidal value of 460 the esophageal pressure or first the peep pressure is still at 12 the esophageal pressure is at 15.5 and notice the negative value of the uh, esophageal transpulmonary pressure which would be the uh, peep level minus the esophageal pressure is, is reading at minus 3.5 so you can see it here also the expiratory transpulmonary pressure of minus 3.5 so what does it mean it means that this pressure is going to uh, put pressure on the uh, lungs and will cause lung collapse what is the intervention that we need to do? We need to increase the beep. So the beep needs to go up so we can make this expiratory transpulmonary pressure a value between zero and five. So we went up to, the, to a beep of 16. But notice first that the peak pressure was here 33. When we went up to 16, the beep is at 16 right now. The esophageal pressure is reading at 15.5. The transpulmonary pressure is now uh, very close to zero, minus 0 0.5. However, take a look on the plateau pressure. The peak pressure is 42 and the plateau pressure is 40. And when you wanted to measure the diving pressure, uh, the, the driving airway pressure, the difference between the plateau and the beep, it is 24. And even the true driving pressure, which is the difference between the inspiratory transpulmonary pressure of 23 minus expiratory transpulmonary pressure of minus 
the true driving pressure is also 24 which is very high so why did that happen why when we went up on the beep the peak pressure went up and the driving pressure went up also it is actually because when we increase the beep this is the difference between this line and this line is the driving pressure when we increase the beep to 16 we push this one here and now we're delivering the same tidal volume so that driving pressure is actually needed much higher because we're reaching the over this uh, uh, distension area of the lung too much pressure to deliver the remaining air okay. so for that reason we decided to go down the tidal volume so we can move that uh, uh, pressure to the left so the tidal volume now is set at 5 ml per kg down to 380 notice that we were able to go down on the big pressure to 37 and probably the plateau pressure was uh, around uh, 32 or 33 with this the expiratory transpulmonary pressure is within the value of 0 to 5 and the inspiratory transpulmonary pressure is less than 12 in fact it is 16 the driving pressure is less than 15 and the true driving pressure is 16 minus 1.1 .1, it is around 15 so it is actually safe tidal volume knowing that the driving pressure is less than 15 so despite uh, despite uh, the fact that we have a high uh, plateau pressure here we are de determining the safety of the volume by looking at the difference between the transpulmonary pressure in inspiration and transpulmonary pressure in expiration the third case will uh, uh, go through chest wall mechanics once more in a patient who is very obese and this patient is 59 year old morbidly obese female who, who was admitted to the intensive care unit with respiratory failure and sepsis the initial settings were with a PEEP of 15, FiO2 of 60%, and the, and the tidal volume of 510. You can see that in order to get that 510, we have a peak pressure of 39, and the plateau pressure is probably around 30. We decided to put an esophageal uh, monitor, and that esophageal monitor was reading esophageal pressure of 27 look at how negative the end expiratory transpulmonary pressure it is actually really at minus 12 despite the fact that the inspiratory transpulmonary pressure is 2.8 however the the transpulmonary the driving pressure is 2.8 minus minus 11 is actually around uh, 14 so what we did here is first we increase the peep from 15 all the way to 22 and the esophageal pressure is reading at 27.8 we were able to improve the transpulmonary pressure in expiration however it is still in negative value we need it to be 0 to 5 so we can avoid any lung collapse but at the same time look at the extremely high airway pressure and plateau pressure so the peak pressure is 54 and the plateau pressure is above 40 so without knowing the esophageal pressure there is no way for you to know that those extremely high pressures are needed for the patient and are safe at the same time you look at the transesophageal pressure in inspiration you should look for a value less than 20 and his pressure is 17 however the true driving pressure for him is still elevated 17 minus minus 5.4 or 5.9 it will give you true driving pressure of 23 and the target should be less than 15 so for that reason we decided to go up higher on the beep to 25 
and we went to the beep of 25, the airway pressure decreased. So what happened is the reason why the airway pressure decreased is because of long recruitment. And notice that the driving pressure is decreased with this. You have esophageal pressure of 27.8 still. The transpulmonary pressure in expiration is minus 1, but the driving pressure difference uh, or the true driving pressure, the difference between the inspiratory uh, transpulmonary pressure and the expiratory transpulmonary pressure is now around 15, which is acceptable. So the final settings were uh, at that time after recruitment uh, uh, completed, we were able to go down on the beep to uh, 22 and uh, keeping the respiratory system driving pressure at uh, 20 or less than 20 in inspiration and the uh, transpulmonary driving pressure 15.5, which was very acceptable, acceptable in this uh, condition. With this, I would like to conclude to say that excessive lung stress and strain is harmful regardless of how generated, how they are generated. Limiting tidal volume and plateau pressure do not always ensure safe ventilation if you do not measure esophageal uh, pressure. Transpulmonary pressure monitoring allows tailoring ventilator settings to optimize ventilation and reduce harm. With this, I would like to conclude my presentation and open the uh, uh, session for uh, any questions that you can send uh, through the chat system. Thank you very much.